When you read through Chinese writings on the geopolitics, and perhaps not just Chinese writings, there's a, a sense of nostalgia for the Cold War, I think, at times. And life might have been a bit more dangerous, but it was easier. You knew where you were. You knew who was on whose side. And in the Chinese case, you had a space to operate between the two superpowers. And with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, we hit the geometric problem of triangles with only two points. And I think for many years, Chinese geopolitical thinking was an attempt to try and recreate triangles. Triangles are nice. Perhaps that's one of the reasons that people in China were so keen on the euro and the European Union being a success to perhaps provide that balance and counterbalance. And maybe it was September the 11th that ironically did create a triangle of sorts that gave China a little bit more breathing space. But with the supposed Asia pivot now turning the United States back onto a supposed Asian focus, and a supposed Asian focus probably means a China focus, um, it's very interesting to read the Chinese thinking on geopolitics and where we are today and what this means for, I think, EU-China relations. I think the first thing to say is there's quite clearly much stronger self-confidence today in China to assert and defend China's core interests. And this includes self-defined uh, conceptions of territory. And uh, these core interests are areas where outsiders aren't really allowed to get, get involved or perhaps sometimes comment on at all. It, it, it's a, a cordon sanitaire in terms of Chinese interests and Chinese debates. But beyond that, there's a very lively and a very plural debate about the nature of the world order and China's place in it. There can be perhaps few places in the world where there's such an ongoing lively debate about what the country should be doing, what its identity should be, where it should be aiming for, and what its goals should be for the future. And as a result of this, it, it's actually not very easy to, to define a very single, clear, coherent, unitary voice about what this future should look like. And, and I think we need to exercise care when we say China says, China thinks, because you know, who speaks for China? It's very easy to pick up on a newspaper report or an academic piece and say, ah, China says, whereas I don't think many people would listen to this and say, Britain thinks. So we need to be careful about how we identify the, the real voice of China. So if it's difficult to find out what this, this debate is about, what is it that, that they're talking about? Well, first, democratization of global governance. That doesn't mean bringing NGOs in, as is the democratization uh, debate in some parts of the West. It means giving more votes to China and other developing countries. Secondly, perhaps it's uh, empowering the United Nations as the real source of authority and taking that authority and power away from the United States and coalitions of the willings. And third, it's allowing for national interpretations of supposedly universal norms, allowing each country to define human rights or define human security in the way that it wants to in keeping with its own domestic interests rather than accepting Western liberal norms. But beyond that, there doesn't seem any great desire or push for what we might call revolutionary change of the system. It's reform of the existing system, an existing system, as you said, that has served China, China so well. But there is a very strong debate over whether China should maintain its policy of maintaining a low profile in international politics. And there are voices that call for maintenance of this policy, and there are voices that call for its abandonment. For those who want to continue the low profile policy, they point to things like Huawei. They say, we don't want to give other countries an opportunity to recreate the China threat thesis and stop us from developing. Best to keep a low profile. Others say, no, we need to focus on domestic development, all the questions, all the issues that you were talking to about poverty and inequality. We don't really want to get involved in global issues that have nothing to do with domestic development. And indeed, as some people argue, if we do develop domestically, then that will have great consequences for the rest of the world. So it's globally responsible to be domestically responsible. But others actually say that we're not prepared yet to take on the costs of being a great power. China is still very poor. It's quite interesting in a lot of the international relations, geostrategic literature, you will find people continue to say, yeah, we're still poor. We might be big, but we're poor. Don't expect us to take on the responsibilities of being a great power just yet. And indeed, some people have argued that talk about the G2 was actually some sort of plot to get China to take on responsibilities well before it was its real time to do so as a global power. Against that, there are a number of people who say, no, we must take a more proactive global role, partly because of popular expectations. The Olympics, the, the, the Shenzhou, the, the astronauts, just the, China, the way China survived the, the global crisis, indeed before that, the Asian crisis. It's time now for China to reassert itself at the top table of global politics. The fact that China has extensive economic interests overseas 
For many means that China can't just sit back and take a, a passive role. It has to get involved in anti-piracy activities off the coast of Somalia, for example. Evacuate Chinese citizens and indeed Taiwanese citizens from Libya, should the case uh, arise. Others say that it's just foolish to let foreign powers set the rules of the global game uh, when China should be an integral part of any reform. And then perhaps a smaller group of people say that it's just the right thing to do as a great power. And indeed, a number of people have pointed out that China is already doing it. The six-party talks, for example, are one example where China is taking a proactive global role. The world in which we live uh, appears to be multipolar. Everybody seems to agree on this, but nobody seems to define what polarity actually means. Uh, in the days of bipolarity, it meant you came together in one camp, you were either attracted to that camp, and if you were attracted to that camp, you were repelled from that camp. Poles attract, but they also repel. This doesn't seem to be what people are talking about when they talk about multipolarity anymore, and I don't just mean within China. All it seems to mean is that we're not unipolar anymore. There are multiple sites of authority, but it's not polar. What we seem to be talking about is loose, fluid, issue-based alliances. Countries coming together when they have shared conceptions and falling apart when they don't. And I think this is very clearly the case in the way that China's geostrategic alliances are being built. Uh, it comes together with countries when there are common interests and moves apart when they don't. I've read a, read a very interesting paper from a journal produced by Kicker, which is associated with the security uh, apparatus in China. And it says that China has four identities, and this is uh, seen in the way that it acts. It has an identity as a developing state, and we see this in its relations with Africa. It has an identity as an emerging power, and we see this in involvement with BRICS. It has an identity as a global power, and we see this in the G20 and the Security Council. And although it sometimes doesn't want to, it has an identity of a quasi-superpower through bilateral action with the United States can solve things. I would add a fifth. China is a regional power. And I think that's really what we're seeing at the moment is the enforcement of the idea of China as a regional power. And coming back to what I've not really mentioned, what this means for EU-China relations, it actually brings us, I think, to the same position that Charles ended up at, but from a different route. We need to identify these different interests. We need to identify where we can engage China as a, a global power, when we should treat it as an emerging power, when we should discuss with it as a, a developing power, and develop multiple strategies, I think, in a way that can properly gain the benefits that, that we in Europe are looking for in our relations with China, but people in China are also very much looking for in their relationships with Europe.